from the kingdom of God. They tried to hurt you. In the midst of you moving forward, God transformed and changed your mind. And he began to hook you up with the power and the precision of God's word. When the word of God begins to move, it elevates. It, it, it convicts. It arrests. It shuts down every negative thing around you that's not like God. The Bible said that every branch he bringeth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bringeth fruit, he prunes. And it may bring forth more fruit. You look at all the prophets. You look at David. You look at Ezekiel. You look at Obadiah. They was connected to the right source. Jesus declared and decreed even when you go back to the word of uh, the book of John. And you talk about how he was divinely connected to his father. We're talking about the precision and the swiftness of God's word on this afternoon. You talk about over the book of John chapter 14. And the word of God said, believe it not that I am in the father and the father is in me. He said, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. He divinely gives up the opportunity that everything he does on work, every work that he does here on earth is of his father's doing. That all he is is just an instrument. Even though he is the son of God, he still got to be under the orchestrating the divine leadership of his father who's in heaven. He says once again over in the book of John, over there in that uh, 14th chapter, in that 10th verse, he said, believe it not that I'm in the father and the father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Yeah, the Bible says he does the work. When you get associated with the right people, you know how to come under leadership and obedience. You don't have to climb up on the backside of nobody's mountain. But God will precisely move you in the direction he designed for you. See, that's connections you got to make. You're talking about uh, God and Abraham, the covenant. You're talking about David and the, the process of how uh, Saul, in the midst of his disobedience, and, and, and how David had held off for such a long time, not putting his hand against God's anointed, because he, you know, the, the word says that he wanted to kill him because of the because of the jealousy that the word has already gained forth. The God has said, "Now nah, I've stripped the kingdom from you, Saul." And now that I've stripped the kingdom from you, you know, you will no longer have the anchor position. That I've designed you to have. When you rebel against God's word. All you're doing is stripping yourself from the very anointing that God has on your life. This is why you got to understand that when God speaks to you. It's just like the word when it came to Peter in the book of Acts. When they begin. When the Herod that devil killed one of the sons of thunder. And they came in and it was pleasing the people that when he done it. And they took Peter and put him in prison with a squadron of soldiers. But even in the midnight hour, just like when Paul and Silas prayed and the prison began to shake, the word of God came with the swiftness of a nanosecond and came and tapped Peter on the backside of his, wherever he was at, a hip, whatever, and said, get up, good, put on your sandals, girl, just and move. You can't delay when God tells you to do something. I love the way the man of God over there in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Louisiana says it. To how he's designed for you. That even when it don't look like things are moving for you. But yet you keep moving forward. And even when the channels seem to be dark before you. God begins to open up the light for you. It's almost like you running down an alley. And, 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 and you keep running through this long tunnel. And, and it don't look like nothing working out for you. But after a while. You begin to see what you call a needle pin of a light. And as you continue to keep on moving. In the midst of the darkness. Not knowing what's around you. It brings me back to the clarity and understanding about, about the word of God talks about the process of the yea do I walk through the shadows of the valley. It's like a dark tunnel when you're going through. You're trying feverishly to move to what God wants you to move. You're trying to do all the things God has orchestrated and designed for you to do. But it seems like the enemy just keep on trying to pounce on you. That's why Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians how you got to get armored up when you're walking through the shadows of the valley of death. When it seems like the enemy is showing and throwing darts from every direction. God is there keeping you on the path of righteousness. Even when they begin to throw their teeth at you. Am I in there anywhere? The Bible says, frat not yourself because of them. Nor those who try to conjure up all the potions and witchcraft to come against you. God knows the plan and the thoughts he got for you, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11. If you can just stick to the plan, according to Ephesians, uh, or not enough, Ephesians Jeremiah 1 and 5, in, a, in, in the name of Jesus. That he know the thoughts and the plan that he got for you. They're good and not of evil. But matter of fact, when we think about the book of Ephesians, when you're going through what seems to be the shadows of the valley of death, I want y'all to hear me when I talk about it. God has put a hedge of protection around you. That even in the midst of what it seems like the enemy is coming at you, he's trying to distort you. The Bible declares, according to Ephesians 1 and 21, he said, Father of all princes and power and dominion. 
He said, not only named in this world, everything was to come. You got to eliminate yourself around people that don't want to go anywhere. People who lean to what they feel their own understanding. God is just still on the throne. God is just still calling his prophets and priests in position to do the things in the land. But you sometime in your own rebellious ways don't think you need nobody to help you get to where you're going. I bet you go to your job and you got a paycheck and if they fire you, you're going to look real sad and bad about that. So you're going to go and obey a man at a job that even in the part of the kingdom of God before you obey the man that God put in a position that he put in an area. Now, well, let me just put it like this plain and simple. You obey the man at your job because you're getting a paycheck. But when God don't even give you a paycheck, but he pays you every day when you wake up in the morning with life, to be able to live it more abundantly, you don't even want to obey him. But as soon as the man get on the phone and call you from your job and tell you got to come to work, you swift to get up and move that because you want to obtain the physical things in life. Yeah, I, I don't want to get down on anybody. I'm just trying to get you to understand, to see something. You think more of the world than you do of God. And it come down to Sunday morning, you're going to heal man of God, to bring forth the word of God. No, you want to lean to your own understanding. But when it come down to man of God who's at that job to call you to come into work, you're going to get up and put your clothes on as swift as quick as you can. And you're going to run to that carnal thing, but you won't run to God the same way you run to that job. I'm not saying that if a man, did, uh, the Bible does say if a man don't work, he don't eat. I understand that process. But that's a work term. But God is trying to get you to understand that you don't got to toil you and you begin to make connection with the right people. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere. I'm just, I'm just all over the place. I want to move here in a minute. And I want to go back over to the book of John, over to the book of the Hebrews. And I want to talk about the comparison of the power and the stealthness of God's word and how uh, the word of God moved with such precision that even if we believe, according to the book of uh, uh, John chapter 14 to him that believe it that God is yet working through you to get a work done here on earth and he kindly says all he, 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 he cries out every day that the harvest is truly great but the labor is few and you keep on running against the tree, bumping your head on the head, keep on bumping your tree, your head on the tree and complaining about the knots on your head. And God is trying to get you to go somewhere for me. In other words, he's trying to get you to understand what it says in First Corinthians. In First Corinthians, second chapter, tell you, for eyes have not seen. God is trying to lead you somewhere to a place that you've never known or been before. You can't cap the word of God. I don't care how educated you may be and how much precision you may be in terms of speaking the word of God. You will never cap the word of God. You can't do it. It, it. it ain't possible for no man. The word been coming from the word been coming forth since the days of the prophets. When you get a man like like Paul who wrote three, four books of the Bible, and you tell me you're a modern day person with your scholars and information, and you're trying to tell me you live a bit more better than that, and you tell me you can put a cap on God's word. Oh God, no, you estranged. You're trying to get people to look to you than look to God. There ain't nothing wrong with you being a bullhorn for the kingdom of God. But the word of God also tells you, don't you think of yourself as being more high than you often. Let's move here over in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 4. We're going to move down here. Let me get this turned over here with you guys. Let me get this. I, I like the roughness of the page. I like the rice. I still yet use the iPads and electronic, but I never get rid of the sword. I always keep a sword with me everywhere I go. I got swords all over the house. That when the enemy seem to come in my house like a flood, I'll chop your head clean off. Because I don't play that. I put that word on whatever it is that's coming in here. And every demon and every devil in hell that try to come against that what God has given me in the season which I'm in, you got to watch yourself. That you got to make sure that you're going to come together and be like a Psalms 133 if you're going to be over here in a part of this house. The Bible says how good is for men to dwell together in unity is, is power in unification. But it's power in precision of a unification that is important that everybody works together as one. Teams don't go out on the field scattered. This is the same thing that happened when we went over to uh, the, the, the word of God over when, when Jairus' daughter uh, was at a sick situation. And, and all these, 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 I don't want to call these, these disbelievers around and say, well, she's dead. But Jesus, no, she ain't dead. And they looked at something like, what's wrong with Jesus? Just no, she ain't dead. No, she ain't dead. And he began to put everybody out that don't need to be there. And he only kept the people that was rolling with him. They really believed that the power of God can move. Sometimes you get in a laboring situation. You don't know which way to go. The Bible said you got to seek ye first the kingdom. God has got all power. See, when you got sometimes you got different people in your group. And you got to be really leery and careful about who's praying with you and praying for you. Because, see, if your life is not showing what it ought to be even if you're away from the house of God as well as being in the house of God, you're going to have a problem because these spirits begin to creep in. The Bible said unaware. The word of God did say in uh, 2 Timothy over there, he said that we're now living in perilous times. 
He talked about how the rebelliousness of men and the lovers of money and the denying of the word will be prevalent in the days in which we're living in today. And this is one thing I'll speak about. You know, I'm not, I don't knock every ministry and I don't knock even my ministry. If I'm not doing right, then I'm not doing, I'm, my ministry not moving right. But we got to be so careful. Y'all got to hear me on this. We got to be so careful that when we go in the house of God, that we're so quick, we're so quick to give our 10% to the house of God, but not get the values of what comes out of that 10% once it's given to the house of God. Let, 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 let me say it like this here. For y'all get a good understanding for those who say, if you're going to give into something, you want to get something out of something. Those of you who are struggling with credit issues, those who are struggling with health issues, those who are struggling with employment issue, issues. That's what I like about uh, Bishop Raymond Johnson. He got all kinds of programs, even from the kids, the college students, the GEDs, for everybody that can help. See, when your kid is flunking out in college or flunking out in high school, see, that that's best program that's designed to help him get back in the position where he needs to be. See, those things bring burdens on your household. And when it brings burdens on your household, it, it allows the enemy to creep in through your armor. It, it gets in. That's why I like things that go on at that Living Faith Christian Center. He's always got programs to touch the family, the things that I need. Even though I pay my 10% in the name of Jesus, and see, he always is giving stuff back to the congregation. You see, you just can't take, 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 push, 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 crush, crush, crush. Bring in programs to show people how to deal with the credit. People how to deal with some of the issues that are going on in the family. Marriage counseling, jobs, GEDs, whatever these things may be. Health issues. Am I in there anywhere? How to conduct yourselves as men and women of God. We have got away from all that stuff. We're going to the house of God. We see all kinds of stuff in the house of God now. You know, because the Bible said you could let the old women need to admonish the young women. As we go out as being evangelists and prisoners on the seat, our job is I heard the man of God say the other day out in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Living Faith Christian Center, that we just can't come in and sit on the pew. And we got a so point that now when we go in the church of God, we've been there so long that, that that's my seat. You ain't got no seat in the house of God. You sit there and say, Glory, hallelujah, whether you're to the back or the front. We rushing and say, I, I, I seen people go as far as putting names on the side of benches. Well, that's what Mary D.D. said. And that was her seat. Hey, 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 oh, really? Let those people begin to come in who don't know much about the word of God. Give them the opportunities. The word of God said, don't be like the rich man. And the one who come in and find a pearl. The one who got what you call traditional uh, lineage in the church. If he really loved the Lord, now I, I take some exception for the older women and the older men. Yeah, they can't get back as far. You know, I don't want them to get trampled in the crowd or something. Like that. I, I take you know measures for that. But but when you come in and say that's my seat and that's why I said and you allow a young man or woman who comes in the house of God that don't know nothing about God and all of a sudden you come and say that's my seat and you want to uproot them and get them up out that seat and that might be the last thing that that may be the last thing you ever see them you don't know what they're dealing with. That they got diagnosed with just to live a few days in their life and God is coming to help them. And so God had them to sit there and here you come, it, walking in the door, say, that's my seat. And you're going to go tell the usher to make them get up out your seat. Now the devil is a lie. Yeah, let, let, let's move here because I, I, I get to talk to y'all about some stuff. Then y'all y'all get upset. I mean, because I don't want to have that. But I want you to understand about the swiftness and the quickness of God's word. He says over in the book of Hebrews, over in the fourth chapter and the twelfth, let's look at the eleventh verse. He said, Us labor therefore to enter into the rest. Now now listen to what he's saying. Let us labor therefore to enter into the rest. L- let me give you some from not from your commentary standpoint of view and what you think it is. See, God gives wisdom. And the Bible says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And God will give to him liberally. See, when you labor to do the work of the kingdom of God, as the word of God said in Matthew 6 and 33, God will give you rest and peace in everything that you do. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Now, that just don't come to anybody. It comes to an area of obedience. When you labor in and doing things for the kingdom of God, that you may grow the kingdom in such a way that you're allowing people to know all the things about the dominion, the domain of the kingdom, and how God has had for them not to toil in their life, but to be able to connect them with an area that when they're going through, that they may have an easy life. They may have a life that's simple, not in toil, not in, in chaos. And when they're going through something, they know how to come to somebody that can, can honestly pray with them and help them and talk with them. See, he said, let us labor, therefore, 
to enter to his rest. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you something from what we call the commentary standpoint of view. And I want you to see something here, but I'm going to give you Charles Ellis's point of view also from the Holy Spirit. Now, the word of God said, let us.